All right, good evening. Welcome to our prayer meeting service here on Wednesday in quarantine, Hattiesburg, Mississippi. I know sometimes it may take a minute or two for everyone to join and to find the link. I hope that this is working properly as it should. It was my desire to bring a message about the Book of Lamentations. It's a very appropriate book at this time. And uh, I think it is a book that is worth studying. I want to greet each one of you in Jesus' name and Thank you for joining. We're so grateful for God's word and for what it means to us and how words written 2,600 years ago still bear repeating and speak to us specifically on what we're going through today. Let's open up with prayer. Father, this afternoon, as we look at your word, I pray that you would give us wisdom. May your word be the balm that we are seeking. May it speak to us and through us. And Father, may you be glorified in all things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to begin by reading the scripture, and then we're going to come back and look at it, um, portions of it, and kind of get a little bit of background. My, um, this is a Bible study, and so my style uh, from just from personal experience is more like a classroom study. And so I like to use PowerPoint, um, but be that as it may, I am. I hope that each one of you are helped in, um, by the Word of God. I'm going to focus my attention on the first 11 verses of Lamentations chapter 1. Lamentations chapter 1 says, How doth the city sit solitary that was full of people? How is she become as a widow, she that was great among the nations, and princess among the provinces? How is she become tributary? She weepeth sore in the night, and her tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers she hath none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They are become her enemies. Judah is gone into captivity because of affliction and because of great servitude. She dwelleth among the heathen. She findeth no rest. All her persecutors overtook her between the straits. The ways of Zion do mourn because none come to the solemn feasts. All her gates are desolate. Her priests sigh. Her virgins are afflicted, and she is in bitterness. Her adversaries are the chief. Her enemies prosper. For the Lord has afflicted her for the multitude of her transgression. Her children are gone into captivity before the enemy. And from the daughter of Zion, all her beauty is departed. Her princes are become like hearts that find no pasture, that is deer, that find no pasture, and they are gone without strength before the pursuer. Jerusalem remembered in the days of her affliction and of her miseries all her pleasant things that she had in the days of old, when her people fell into the hand of the enemies, and none did help her. The adversaries saw her and did mock her at her Sabbaths. Jerusalem hath grievously sinned, therefore she is removed. All that honored her despise her, because they have seen her nakedness, yea, she sigheth and turneth backward. 
Her filthiness is in her skirts. She remembereth not her last end. Therefore she came down wonderfully. She had no comforter. O Lord, behold my affliction, for the enemy hath magnified himself. The adversary hath spread out his hand upon all her pleasant things. For she hath seen that the heathen entered into her sanctuary, whom thou didst command that they should not enter into thy congregation. All her people sigh, they seek bread, they have given their pleasant things for meat to relieve the soul. See, O Lord, and consider, for I am become vile. As we look at Lamentations and consider what would it have been like that day when Jeremiah felt so constrained to put pen to paper Jerusalem burned, sacked, desolate, destroyed. It reminds me, um, starting out with just the idea of the book of Lamentations, it reminds me that Isaiah told the story and characteristics of the suffering servant of the Lord. But it seems to me that Jeremiah felt the heartthrob of this suffering in a unique way. He was called the weeping prophet. And that's one of the key elements that I want to focus on today as we look at these first 11 verses is the nature of this lamentation. Jesus said that man of sorrows in Matthew 23, 37, after he had predicted prophetically there in Matthew 23, the, the coming and fall of the city of Jerusalem, he cries and he weeps and he says, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have sent you sent unto you how often would i have gathered your children together even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings and ye would not as we think about this man jeremiah and his mission there are some things that we know that come to mind that help us kind of frame the lamentation that he presented. He wasn't allowed to marry because of the instability in Israel during the war-torn period. We realize that Jeremiah was a man who um, had a very solitary, a very lonely ministry. Working alone, uh, standing alone against all the adversity, not even having the comfort of a wife and family. He was ostracized and prophesied against the sins of his own family, the priests and Levites. Um, as a the weeping prophet, some people would have called him sensitive. We we get that picture if, if we had um, the opportunity to read through the book of Jeremiah and his expression of deep feeling through all the adversity that he faced. But he was not weak. He was, in, strict, in fact, very strong. Um, he had an innate co coping mechanism, which was prayer. And we notice it here even in the verses that we read as he is in the process of lamenting, as he is in the process of speaking um, these words, he turns to the Lord and says, O oh Lord, O oh Lord. Few men have coped with the level of pain and suffering, both societal 
and emotional and spiritual and physical that Jeremiah experienced. And yet, at the same time, I don't want to say that um, he was the only one to have gone through such things. Rather, that um, he was... A, he was left up as a sign. He was left up as a symbol, um, as an ideal um, that we can also look to and that we can find um, relatability to. There'll, there'll be um, some things that resonate from his experience in our own experience of uh, the problem of pain in human experience. So what about pain? Is pain fair? Is just is justice for pain something that we should seek? Other questions come to mind as we think about this problem of pain. For example, we think of um, the great um, energy, and I think it's very it's worthy. It's worthwhile that is expended in the medical community and science. Is there a permanent solution to pain? Can we resolve it? Should we attempt to pursue relief of pain? And, and I have to answer absolutely a resounding yes. I mean, Jesus Christ himself said, as the suffering servant, he came to, um, to heal the brokenhearted, to save the afflicted to deliver the, the prisoners out of bondage. And I think there is a place for God's church to be involved in pain and relief, relief of pain and relief of suffering in whatever form it is found. I think we're entering into and fighting against the works of the devil, which Jesus came to destroy. And also the last question how does this perspective on pain give us hope in working through our own pain? And I hope that this is one of the main questions that is uh, uh, allowed to be answered through the study of the Book of Lamentations. Spoiler alert. <laughs> um, if you get to read the end of the chapter, Jeremiah was the book that Daniel read in order to receive hope for the coming of the Son of Man. Jeremiah had specific dates and times mentioned in uh, in his prophecy that Daniel was able to grab hold of and cling to, and then he got further information about as he began to uh, explore this idea of... Um, the coming of Christ. And then the Lord gave him further revelation, right? About the, the 70 weeks and the 62 weeks and the seven weeks and um, Christ coming in the middle of the week and all, all the prophetic timeline there was based on the revelation that God gave Jeremiah. So Jeremiah went through some of the worst times, but God is faithful and in order for him to cope he gave him some special insight into the works that God was in the process of doing we um one of our favorite verses from Jeremiah is i know the thoughts that i think towards you right thoughts of good and not of evil to give you an expected end so while the process of pain is difficult and dramatic in our lives, and yet there is a purpose and there's a reason for it, and it and it plays itself out through the process of time within the grace of God. Let's think about the place, the city of Jerusalem. So throughout these verses. The, the city of Jerusalem is personified as a woman, as a lady. Um, it's talked about she, her, she's become a widow, 
Um, and it uses many kinds of metaphor regarding uh, the city of Jerusalem. But in essence, um, it is talking about the city itself, right? But let's think about as we explore this idea of the city of Jerusalem, it is a place, right? It's a, it's a physical location. It is a, I mean, even to this day, it's inhabited. Um, the American embassy was moved to the city of Jerusalem. Um, but it, there's also other things connected with the city of Jerusalem that, that um, kind of, the, there's this whole body of thought and memory and perspective that comes into talking about the city of Jerusalem. So when I say the word Jerusalem, what comes to your mind? What do you think of Jerusalem? Is it, is it the city that David built? Is it the city that Jesus walked on? Is it the city that got destroyed by Jeremiah? There's the nostalgia um, for many of the, the Jews as they... Um, as they traveled there to the city of Jerusalem to celebrate the feasts year in and year out, three times a year, they went to Jerusalem. It was this, you know, I mean, can you imagine the excitement? You haven't been there in six months. You know, you come in from the country to bring your sacrifices, to bring your first fruits, to bring your offerings. And everybody's excited. It's a, it's a holiday. It's a feast day community. Jerusalem also represents the community of faith, the community of saints worshiping together, the community of, of um, those who have experienced the promises of God. And it's home for those who had been carried away into captivity it was a picture of home. It was a picture of, you know, that place that they are now removed from, but which they long to be back in. The Book of Lamentations was one of the most treasured portions of Scripture for the diaspora, for the, for the immigrants that left and were far away from Jerusalem. They read it over and over again. In fact, um, one of the feasts uh, after the, the destruction of the temple, one of the feasts that became part of um, the Jewish tradition afterwards was the Feast of the Destruction of Jerusalem, right? The, the anniversary of the destruction of Jerusalem. And on that anniversary, the Book of Lamentations is read every year. As it is memorialized, they read. Um, so... The Book of Lamentations is one of those roles, one of those writings that was read on feast day, like Ruth and like Esther. Um, there was a couple other writings. I'm trying to think of them. Song of Solomon. And it's sacred. It's the place that God chose. It's the place where God um put his promises right um it's the place that god told abraham to take and to um sacrifice his son there and as abraham sacrificed his son god ha hallowed it it's the place where god stopped the plague whenever david offered the all uh, there on the altar it's the place that god chose to bring his um, representation there, to bring the Ark of the Covenant, to build the temple. It's the place that the Bible says God's eye is always toward that piece of real estate, that property. Now, as we think and talk about the promises that God gave, um, we tend to make comparison usually to our physical state. And, and in fact, 
as Christians, I mean, as humans built, created in the image of God, it's very difficult, if not virtually impossible, to separate our physical existence from our spiritual existence, right? And so there's an element in which our physical existence and our spiritual existence have to be um, connected. But unfortunately, the nation of Israel um, was only part of the covenant of God. The physical nation of Israel was only part of the covenant. And he wanted to, as through the process of his redeeming our lives, redeeming us physically, redeeming our souls mentally, emotionally, and redeeming our spirit to be brought back into right relationship with Christ, or with God through Christ. Um, that full expression of of God's uh, of of God's promises will not be present until heaven right so it's not our physical nation even though we love our physical nation of america our nation isn't the epitome of a christian nation um even though there were principles developed there and there are some special privileges there but if we examined history we see that that was true of many other nations as well uh, england and france and the philippines in recent years and south korea and taiwan they're all um nations that were founded on christian principles or there was christian principles in their founding and they have a uh, legitimate claim to be christian nations and yet there is this this disconnect this dissonance that it's not what it should be right because the kingdom of god isn't come in full the king has come as a suffering servant and the king has done his due diligence in redeeming our lives from death through his death on the cross and he is in the process of bringing us along and, and preparing us um, for the future, but it's not yet fulfilled, and it won't be fulfilled until the future. So it's important to keep that future perspective there. And now this is the main heart of the message that I want to bring today is what kind of a person, what kind of a preacher was Jeremiah? Jeremiah in his attitude of, of preaching here in the book of Lamentations, there's not even a hint anywhere in uh, the book of Lamentations of I told you so. There's not this, this um, pride or this perspective of, um, you know, of arrogance at all in his demeanor. There's not a, a um, even as he warned them for 30 years, hoping and praying to prevent this destruction, there's not um, any, any place for his, um, where he expressed this kind of selfish or pride. He wasn't thinking about himself. He wasn't thinking about, um, you know, I won that argument or anything like that. It was always with a heart for the nation that he was speaking to. Let's talk about um, the pain a little bit more in detail. Um, just a couple of quotes from some of the um, commentaries that are here. I love the, the way the Book of Lamentations, the way um, uh, McGee, J. Vernon McGee presents it. He says that the, the, the Book of Lamentations is an elegy, or it's elegiac poetry. 
and an elegy is written as a tribute to for a funeral. He says that he, Jeremiah witnessed the destruction of Jerusalem, and as he saw it burn, he sat down in the warm ashes, tears streaming down his face. That's kind of the picture that um, McGee presents here um, uh, of the book of Lamentations. In describing it, he says it's a paean. Oh, sorry. It is a paean of pain, a poem of pity, a proverb of pathos. It's a hymn of heartbreak, a psalm of sadness, a symphony of sorrow, and a story of sifting. You know, at that same spot in Jeremiah chapter 22 and 23 and 27, um, as Jeremiah was looking at those baskets of fruit, there were two kinds of baskets, right? At the same point where he says, I have plans for you to give you a future and an end, there was also a group that didn't have that same promise, right? There was the baskets of evil fruit at the same time that there was the baskets of good fruit. In fact, the ones who got left behind um, what, what the Babylonians considered the dregs of society, the priests and um, such like, were, in Jeremiah, according to Jeremiah 22 and 23, were the, were the bad fruit. And the ones who got pulled out of that situation and put through the sifting process were the good fruit and the ones that God had good intentions for. So this lamentation is also the wailing wall of the Bible. And in fact, um, many Jews recite portions of the lamentations when they visit the wailing wall there in Jerusalem. But let's look a little bit more at the structure of it. Um, I read a couple of things from J. Sidlow Baxter in um, his commentary. And he points out, I'll come to this in a minute. He points out the structure um, he says these five elegies, these five chapters, each of them, in a sense, a self-contained poem, are not unconnected digits. They belong together, like the five fingers of your hand, right? He's referring to the five digits, five fingers of your hand. So they belong together, and they make one complete poetic quintuplet. This fivefold poem is built up in an acrostic form. That is, all the chapters have the same number of verses, 22, while the middle chapter has exactly three times that number, 66. This is because there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So the first line of each, um, of each verse starts with a Hebrew um, letter of the alphabet. I don't know what it looks like in your Bible, but in my Bible, it has, um, you know, Aleph, Beth, Gimel, Daleth. Um, it has the Hebrew letters at the beginning of each verse, just to give that indication. Kind of like Psalm 119, if you'll remember Psalm 119, where each of the eight verse sections um, is an acrostic based on that particular letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And then a little bit more talking about the structure, he says there's two outer poemets, the first and the fifth, and they correspond. There's two inner poemets, the second and the fourth, and they correspond. And then the middle one, the third, which is the most elaborate in conception and the most finished in execution, is three times the size of the others and stands in the center. And it has, like I said, 66 um, verses. So the first three verses um, represent A. The next three verses represent Beth. The third, um, the 
the next three verses represent Gimel, Daleth, on so on. So it's three three verse sections um, there in the middlemost uh, chapter, chapter three of Lamentations. And so as we consider this first chapter, and especially the first part of it, let's let's break it down a little bit more. Baxter says, take the first of the five. The subject here is Jerusalem's plight. Jerusalem's problem, their, their situation. What is the situation here? What is this picture of destruction? And uh, Jeremiah goes into detail. The little piece is in two parts. Notice that verses 1 to 11 are in the third person. The prophet is speaking about the city. He's outlining her situation. It is a, a proper um, theatrical introduction. It's the, the opening monologue, if you will, to this piece. If you can imagine this poem, it's written in poetic form, but it could also be performed as a play, as a dialogue. And there are three actors. There is the prophet, Jeremiah. There is the city itself. Um, the the daughter of Zion, and then there is, of course, um, the Lord, and they interact, and they they each speak their part as it come as it comes and is as as it emerges. So this is, Zion is the city of David. Um, many times through the prophets. It's called the, the daughter of Zion. Think about that for a minute. The daughter of Zion. It's not Zion, but it's the daughter of Zion. So it's like this, this spiritual body of people who have been born of Zion and have inherited the traits of Zion and have inherited the culture of Zion. What does Zion represent? Zion is the city of David. Excuse me, it's the castle. It was the symbol of David's war years and the subsequent protection of the nation of Israel that resulted from these many years of peace. Um, it was a symbol of the promises of God to Abraham, right? And Israel had a unique promise that don't belong to anyone else. And so... Um, as the immigrants look back to Zion, as the daughters of Zion, the offspring of it, now living far away, yet carrying Zion with them in their hearts, right? Can you imagine the, the pain and the trauma of going through that destruction and finding yourself in Babylon and now facing... a uh, the prospect of many years, actually, not unnumbered years, but many years. And, and God says, tells them, settle down, build houses, plant gardens, raise children, because um, you have some time, you have to do your time here before you can go back. And in fact, um, in many ways, they never went back. Only a portion, only a, um, a remnant went back at any point. And it's still true to this day. There, though the nation has revived in some senses, in some political senses, uh, it's still a remnant of the daughter of Zion, the, the people, the offspring, the descendants of that, of that place, of that thing of that promise. And then also the immigrants knowing that they were partly to blame for losing the good thing that you had. What a picture. 
there. As I was saying, I'm sorry, I kind of uh, got a little bit out of order. Um, but this is a poem enacted. It's a theatrical piece. Um, and it has been used as prayer. And in fact, it's as if the prophet was putting prayer into the mouths of the exiles, giving them words to say. It's a dialogue, a three-way conversation, and it identifies the actors, Jeremiah, Jerusalem, and the Lord. And um, so as we read, and as I, the reason I focused on the first 11 verses, partly that's the first section, right? First large section of the verses. But you perceive the role of the preacher here as he is dealing with um, the nation of Israel. As he is giving these um, observations and these words, both of lament, of tribute, of reflection, meditation, and of hope, right? As we as we work through the poem, we'll find those points of hope as well, right? The name of the book in Hebrew is Aika, Aika, and it's Alas, how? How? And that's the first word that we have in our translation in English, right? How doth a city sit solitary that was full of people? And then the ellipsis carries that same uh, parallelism to the next line. How is she become as a widow, she that was great among the nations and a princess among the provinces, how has she become the tributary? Wow, her that was the empress, her that was the the um the queen of the empire, her that receives tribute now is paying tribute, her that ruled from the Euphrates to the Nile now is being ruled by the Babylonians there on the Euphrates River. So they're asking this rhetorical question, how is it possible? First of all, how is it possible? Secondly, how is it fair? How is it fair that the people that have the promises of God should be treated so um, cavalierly in this way? How is it that such things can happen to these good people? And then thirdly, how is this state of affairs to be tolerated? How do we just sit by and put up with this happening? So these are the kinds of questions. And he begins his lament with the questions that are uppermost in, a, in every person's mind, right? Uppermost in these immigrants' minds. Uppermost in the sufferer's mind. They have these questions of how, how can it happen? What? We would ask why, right? Basically the same kind of question. Why did this happen? Why is it happening this way? And so as we read um, it again, let's look at these verses. How doth the city sit solitary that was full of people? How has she become as a widow, she that was great among the nations, and princess among the provinces? How has she become tributary? She weepeth sore in the night, and her tears are on her cheek. Among all her lovers, she hath none to comfort her. All her friends have become treacherous, have dealt treacherously with her. They have become enemies. So at the same time that he starts by asking the question how, then, you know, we want to question God, but then we have to realize, we have to be self-reflective. And realize, you know, where am I at? Where is everyone? You know, where are where where's the party? Where's the gang that I've been hanging out with these last few years? Where are my lovers? Where are my friends? 
and unfortunately um they gave over a desire and a and a love and a and a following of the lord to follow the babylonian gods and the egyptian gods and the assyrian gods judah has gone into captivity because of affliction and become and because of great servitude she dwells among the heathen and finds no rest all her persecutors overtook her between the straits Sorry, these are a little bit small. The way of Jerusalem is, the ways of Jerusalem do mourn. The paths, the, the roads, all the streets are in mourning, right? There's, because instead of feast, instead of party, instead of festivities, instead of worship, now it's quiet. Everybody's in quarantine, right? Everybody is indoors. Well, not even there, actually. Her gates are desolate. Her priests sigh. Her virgins are afflicted. She's in bitterness. Her adversaries, her enemies, are now in charge. They're the ones cracking the whip. They're the ones um, um, calling the shots. And she, on the other hand, is in is the is the butt of the whip is the is the tail is the um you know the 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 promises that God gave both in Deuteronomy and in Second Chronicles that when they forsake him that they will lose that privileged position that they have. And so, as they become self-reflective, it's the job of the preacher to put in their mouths the kind of confession that is needed. The kind of, of agreement with God, the kind of repentance that they need. The Lord has afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions. That's the situation. That's the thing that they need to be sure that they understand and that they acknowledge. Her children are gone into captivity before her. The daughter of Zion, all her beauty is departed. Oh yeah, Vav, the V means and. All her beauty is departed. Her princes are become like um, deer that find no pressure that find no pasture who they're they're like the deer that are hunted they're bambies right the hunters after them and they can't find any place of peace they're gone without strength because of the pursuer jerusalem remembered in the days of her affliction and of her misery all her pleasant things that she had in the days of old. That place of nostalgia. That that um that place of memory. Like I said, to to be that immigrant that perceives, you know, I had a good thing and I am the one that messed it up. I'm the one that gave it up. Um, I didn't value what I had. I didn't value God. When her people fell into the hand of the enemy and none did help her, the adversary saw her and did mock at her Sabbaths. Oh, yeah, y'all are celebrating the Sabbaths? And in fact, that's why God gave them 70 years of captivity because that equated the 77s, the 490 years that the, the children of Israel had refused to observe the Sabbath years, right? Um, whenever the Lord instituted the um, the law in Deuteronomy, he said, when you go into the land, you can work 
and labor and farm the land six years and let it remain fallow on that seventh year. And, you know, there's just too much time. There's not enough food for the kids. There's not enough um, money. We've got to get, we got to keep the economy going. Um, all these kinds of things. And they found one excuse after another to keep farming that seventh year and that seventh year and that seventh year. And there never came a time when they had just quite enough to make it through another year, never mind that they weren't just trusting the Lord. And so they had put off celebrating that Sabbath year after year after year. And the Lord said, all right, well, you have accumulated 70 sevens. And so you're going into captivity for 70 years. And then the land will, by force, get her Sabbaths. And that's why that is the reason for the 70 years of, of, of isolation, of, of um, going into captivity. Jeremiah, oh, sorry, verse 8. Jerusalem hath grievously sinned. He is having them repeat after him, right? Spell it out. Say it. Say it out loud. You have sinned. Therefore, she is removed. All that honored her despise her now because they've seen her nakedness. Yea, she sigheth and turneth backwards. The shame, the disgrace to be stripped in front of those that she was trying to keep up appearances for. Her filthiness is in her skirt. She remembereth not her last end. Therefore, she, she came down wonderfully. What was her last end? What, what, what was her destiny? What was her purpose? What was the goal for which she was created? She forgot. She forgot she was created for God, for His glory. And because of that, then um, she was focused on the here and now, the momentary, and... And using, you know, using that whatever it took to keep things going. All that honored her despise her now because they have seen her nakedness. Sorry. Verse 9. She hath, she had no comforter. Therefore she came down wonderfully. And this idea of wonderful isn't that in a good sense, but in an amazing, amazingly sad and um, difficult way. She came down. And then what does the preacher do? Like I, like I mentioned earlier, he says, Oh, Lord, behold my affliction. I wanted to read um, a, a couple of notes from J. Vernon McGee. I'm wrapping it up. We're almost done here. But J. Vernon McGee talks about the nature of this man, Jeremiah, and the way he preached. He was a weeper, and he was a prayer. The reason that he could say the kinds of hard, harsh things that he did and get away with it is because his heart was tender, his heart was broken. Um, it's told, the story is told about Dwight L. Moody was the only man, um, Dr. Dale of the Birmingham University, um, of the Birmingham Seminary said that D Dwight L. Moody was the only man qualified to preach on hell. He said, because he preached on it with tears. Here's a, here's a story that um, Vernon McGee uh, shares. Back in the 1600s, um, just shortly after Shakespeare was off the scene and his plays were being played in every theater in England, there was a, a famous actor by the name of David Garrick. 
who was walking down the street in London one day and found a man standing on the corner just yearning over the people. Garrick said, I stood on the outside of the crowd. I found myself imperceptibly working myself in until I stood right under that man, and there came down from his breast hot tears. He went on to say that there was a woman there pointing her shaking, withered finger at the man who spoke, and she said, Sir, I have followed you since preach since you preached this morning at seven o'clock, and I've heard you preach five times in the streets of the city, and five times I have been wet with your tears. Why do you weep? That preacher was George Whitfield, who also came to America and, and was part of the Great Awakening. A cross-eyed man who has been burlesqued on the English stage and denounced from almost every pulpit in the country. And yet David Garrick went on to say, I listened to George Whitfield, and as I listened to him, I saw his passion and his earnestness. I knew that he meant that without Christ, men would die. He didn't just say it, he meant it. As I listened to him, he came to the place where he could say no more. And he reached up those mighty hands, and the voice almost like a thunderstorm, as he said one final word, Oh! Oh, just that one syllable. Oh! Why, he could break an audience with that word. When George Whitfield said, Oh, men bowed before the Holy Spirit like corn rows before the wind. Garrick went on to say, I would give my hand full of gold sovereigns if I could say, Oh, like George Whitfield. I would be the greatest actor that the world has ever known. The only difference is, of course, that George Whitfield was sincere. He was not acting. And Jeremiah was that kind of a prophet. That very first word there of Lamentations. Um, how does it go? Aika, Aika, alas, how? That's that that's that idea. That that cry, that gut level welling up of emotion in which he in which he expresses the pain, the full range of pain, not just the pain for the circumstances, but the pain for the sin and the pain for the covenant broken and the pain for the loneliness and the pain for the price. And we have that same picture of Christ as he was in the garden and he, and he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And as he groaned in the spirit, it says God sent angels to strengthen him so that he could go on praying. And he says, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Christ knew the price, the cost of sin. And he paid that cost. And here, Jeremiah is putting these words into the mouth of the people as they recite this poem, that they will feel the weight of the sin that they have committed, and that they will, with God, acknowledge, Oh God, alas, how? How could I have done that? How could I have allowed that situation to continue? And so um, we have there that picture of of the of the of the weeping pre preacher. Let's read our last couple of verses. The adversary has spread out her hands upon all her pleasant things, upon all Jerusalem's pleasant things. That, that you know they've laid their filthy fingers all over, on things that were precious. They carried away the treasures out of the house of God. 
She has seen that the heathen entered into the, her sanctuary, whom thou didst command that they should not enter into thy congregation. All her people sigh, they seek bread, they're starving, they need food. They have given her the pleasant things for meat to relieve the soul. And then how does the preacher end? He says, see, O Lord, and consider, for I am become vile. As we conclude this message, may our hearts also break for people, for the destruction of sin. And may our hearts yearn for the coming of the kingdom. And in that yearning, may we become part of working for, towards the coming of the kingdom of God. May God add his blessing to his word tonight. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this word. Help us to understand and to recognize and to feel it. Lord, may it penetrate our hearts and may it motivate us. May your Holy Spirit work in us. Lord, may we see ourselves as you see us and at the same time see Christ as our all-sufficient hope and help and place our trust in him. And through his energy, Father, may we serve you for the coming kingdom, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening, and thank you for participating in our service tonight. God bless each of you, and...